Welcome, and thank you for joining the Leamington United Mennonite Church as we have a time of worship, praise, and uplift on this wintry day in January. We hope that this time of worship will bring a pause into your life today, that you are able to detach, remove yourself from that which surrounds you for a time of hopeful inspiration and reassurance that God is with us. Whether you are joining us today or in the days ahead, or from afar or here locally, may this be a meaningful time of reflection and prayer, of song and meditation, which allows us to feel God's Spirit working among us. Since last March, when the pandemic began to affect us, LUMC has continually sought ways in which we can connect with the followers, whether by YouTube, live streaming, or when it was allowed to have a gathering here in the sanctuary, but always following the best practices outlined for us by the Public Health Unit and the provincial government. Our COVID status has changed this past week, again with COVID numbers rising in our community and in our province. And so, as you all know, a stay-at-home order has been given by the provincial government. And in response to this order, LUMC is reducing the personal presence here in the sanctuary over the course of the next five, year, five weeks and using pre-recorded music and song from various services in the past and also locations and pastoral messages that are given from various venues. This will help us to remain compliant with the public health unit and also take the precaution and the prevention that is needed at this time. And I know that Pastor David is going to be sharing more details about this later on in the service, about what this means for our pastoral ministry. I know that we are all longing for a new day in which there is less illness and better health, security and restored well-being to the world, to our country, to our province and to our community. But in all of these changes, our purpose remains constant to be with God, and to be with one another in fellowship in whatever way that we can. And so I welcome you today with Paul's greeting to the Corinthians, which is as relevant today as it was when he first spoke it and wrote it to the Corinthians. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God and the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, so that we can comfort others in their troubles. God has delivered us from a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him have we set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. So now we are going to hear a gathering song before our call to worship. Our first song, Holy God, we praise thy name. And so I invite you to stand here, follow along. It's number 121 in our hymn books.
the worship singers for that gathering song. Please join me now in a call to worship by reading the dark print, and I will lead in the light print. God is here among us. God is here within us. Come, let us worship the Lord in the holiness of his presence. We come as your people, praising your faithfulness, giving thanks for your mercy seeking your grace. May your spirit be present among us, uniting us as your faithful followers, filling us with your abiding peace and love. Amen. And please now join me in prayer. We all come to you, Lord, from many different places and times, but united in your spirit, praising your faithfulness giving thanks for your mercy, seeking your healing. In this hour of worship, enlighten us with your word. Inspire us with your promise to never leave nor forsake us. Encourage us with your voice of hope. Instruct us with your infinite wisdom. Enfold us within your community. May we hear about your kingdom of kindness so that we may seek it. Show us your justice Embrace us with your forgiveness. Allow us to walk with you humbly, closely, daily. Amen. And now, please join together with the worship team as they lead us in song, Ancient Words. Oh, let the ancient words 
impart. I will now share the first scripture reading, which comes from Daniel 3, verses 8 to 18. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sounds of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Mesach, Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sounds of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. The word of God. The Newfold family is now going to sing When We Walk with the Lord. There's no one. 
I'd like to share the second scripture reading, which comes from Daniel 3, verses 19 to 29. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God's. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Mezach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Mezach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Mesach and Abednego be cut into, the, into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this word. The word of the Lord. We have uh, a number of things that uh, we want to uh, inform you uh, at this time. Um, family happenings are always important and interesting to hear what's going on at LUMC. The, first of all, the regulations that which, uh, which we have at this time from the provincial government doesn't in any way interfere with our giving. And LUMC remains grateful for the support in so many different ways that you have given. And so in the future, again, financial contributions can be given simply by check in the secured mailbox or online giving or by, uh, by a withdrawal from, from your account uh, on, on a rhythm that you would like to see, and, uh, and support the ministries of our church. At this time, we also have a message from Ken Hildebrand, our Chair of Church Council. Hello, LUMC. Ken Hildebrand from Church Council. I have an important announcement for you today. Our skilled and talented LUMC Church Secretary, Jane Clausen, has decided it's time to close this chapter of her story and has announced her retirement. I will read a short excerpt of her letter. I have enjoyed my almost nine years of working at the church. I cherish the friendships I have made during my years of employment. This has been an amazing opportunity for me. I am so blessed to be part of this workplace and congregation. Jane, we shall miss your skills and commitment to LUMC as our Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you for your service to LUMC in this way. Posting for the position of LUMC Secretary along with job description will be posted next week. Please join me in congratulating Jane as she moves on to the next chapter of her life. God bless.
and uh, for that information. Pastor David is also here to give us some details about the changes over the course of the next five weeks. Pastor David, please. Good morning, friends. As our worship leader mentioned, uh, there have been some changes this Sunday in our worship. We're very small in numbers here today. All our musicians are gone, those who would normally be up here leading in singing and playing. Instead, we're using pre-recorded music from the past, recordings from the summer, the fall. Uh, fortunately, we have a lot to draw upon. But why are we doing this? Well, given the rising numbers of infection in our community, we asked what our response might be. So Church Council met this week along with the COVID response team. Together they decided to minimize the number of people who are involved in our worship services, to scale back our participants here, including those in the sound booth, something that will be in effect for the next few weeks. Because above all, we want to say that we care about our community, about our families, and it's our way of showing love to those around us by doing our part to limit the spread of this virus. In the meantime, we're thankful we can continue providing these services to you. We have the resources at hand, the willing volunteers, the staff, to do the work needed to make all this possible. We know how important it is to be able to gather for worship, how many people depend on this ministry each week for support and for comfort. As announced before, our church building continues to be closed. Our secretary, Jane, is working from home along with most of our staff. But we want to assure you that we are still available and ready to serve and help in whatever way we can. As pastors, we recognize that this is a very hard time for many of you. Those at the Mennonite home have been isolated and alone for far too long. Many of our younger families are struggling with online education, both teachers and parents. Some of you are having serious health challenges. Medical appointments are postponed, surgeries, consultations. Others are facing financial stress and job loss. Just this week alone, I've had three people call me asking for prayer for loved ones in critical condition with COVID. And all this in addition to the uncertainty we face about the future and what this coming year might hold for us. This is not an easy time. So I want to share a pastoral word with you, a word of encouragement and hope in these uncertain times. It's taken from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my burden is light and my yoke is easy. I think that describes many of us today, weary and burdened. I hear it wherever I go. And so this invitation is for us maybe more than ever today, to come to Jesus, our good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for us, who knows each of us by name, who will never leave or forsake us, to come and to learn from him, from his ways, his faith, his faithfulness, to learn his prayer life, to learn his calm assurance in the face of suffering, to learn his steadfast hope and love, to learn his gentle and humble ways. Yes, to learn from Jesus. It's a beautiful invitation. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. But this is also a call for us to be the church today, the body of Christ, his hands, his feet, his listening ear. There are so many opportunities to do that today, even though we can't gather here. I know there are some small groups that continue to meet online. I encourage you. We have a virtual foyer now, meeting after the worship service. Today, Vic Winter will be sharing in one of those breakout groups. There's a book club starting this month. 
more information, your bulletin. I've heard some of you are on the phone each day, checking in on people, asking if they need assistance. We have financial help available for those who are struggling to pay their bills. We have counselors available for those who need help with anxiety or depression. There's a catechism class meeting weekly on Zoom. And Pastor Mike is beginning another Bible study next month. Our pastors are always available for prayer and for support at any time. So these are all the ways that we continue being the church through all this, the body of Christ to each other. So my brothers and sisters, let's remain hopeful and faithful. God is with us and will never fail us. And he will see us through this. Amen. Amen. Pastor David, thank you for bringing those words to us. We appreciate you and the entire PMT very much at LUMC. There is one further announcement, and uh, Pastor David already alluded to that, and that is a book study that is beginning on February the 2nd. There is more information in the bulletin or go on Facebook. Uh, and for any questions, please call Erwin Thiessen, who will be leading it. The book is entitled Unafraid, Moving Beyond Fear-Based Faith by Benjamin Corey. And now, a song that will introduce prayer, Call Me Lord. and group for that song of introduction, please join me now in a congregational prayer. Lord, your love is without limit and end. You are with us always in the joys of our lives and also in our challenges. You are a sovereign God, and your grace and power envelops and surrounds us in all we experience. We may not understand the unexplained suffering the illness and global pandemic, nor the personal obstacles that confront us at this time. But you are a purposeful God who leads us through the storms of life and our daily existence. We come, first of all, with thanksgiving. Thank you for the many acts of kindness we have witnessed and experienced, the encouraging words, the deeds of love and support, the listening ears. We thank you for this winter season, a time which has its own natural beauty and rhythm, for the joys of family, food, and memorable moments, 
the ability to carefully connect with family and friends through Zoom and other ways. But even as there is so much to be thankful for, we also lament the unpredictable changes and the challenges which the pandemic has brought into our lives. We pray for people who feel lonely and forsaken, anxious and filled with despair. Please give strength to all workers, frontline caregivers, providers of many essential services of all kinds, teachers and grocers, shop owners and manufacturers and others. Give them strength to overcome the challenges of their daily tasks and services. Allow them to find new ways and paths to serve the community and individuals in need. We continue to pray for the treatment and the use of vaccines in response to the COVID virus that affects us all. Give insight to those manufacturing and those distributing the vaccine as we seek a new day in our efforts to bring this deadly disease under control. Give wisdom to our politicians on all levels who are making difficult decisions. Help them to work toward the common good that will benefit all, not just a few. Be with the United States as they transition to a new president and administration in the upcoming week. Hear our prayers for all the parents who are cooking and cleaning, caregiving and homeschooling their children while working from home or perhaps even a workplace. Yes, our children cannot understand these changes and they are missing their friends and activities. Be with our pastors, the PMT, our technicians and volunteers here at LUMC who are bringing us worship services and other congregational connections and supports during this time of precaution and prevention. Open our ears to hear each other's stories so that we can be a community of hope, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community, reaching out and nurturing each and every person with tenderness and compassion. We pray especially for Adam Croker, who just yesterday came home from hospital following surgery. Give him strength and hope during this time of restorative home care. Allow your presence to be felt by Annie and Henry Hildebrandt, whose grandfather passed away Friday at Leamington Hospital. Be with them as they plan a celebration of life for their grandfather, Johann Hildebrandt. Be with our ministries of elder care, those at the home. Be with education, those who are involved in that, in that ministry. Protect our elderly and vulnerable, our young families and others from the effects of the pandemic. Lord, you have promised to be with us always, in all our days. May your abiding and generous love, your strength and presence, give each of us fresh hope for new days ahead. Amen. And now, Pastor Mike will join, the will join us for the message. <clears throat> Let us pray. Gracious Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable and bring glory to you. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For those of you who grew up going to Sunday school, those names in the story of the fiery furnace in flannel graph told in the basement classroom are forever etched in your memories. We have assumed this story was a captivating but also fairly straightforward one. Three stout-hearted young men, strangers in a strange land, would rather be burnt to a crisp than bend the knee before the bad king's statue. We dismiss this story as a childhood fable, without realizing that, is that it is far more true than we realize. The more you read the Bible, the more you begin to pick up on instances where individuals are more than just individuals. They represent larger realities. One person stands for a whole group of people. Scholars sometimes call this corporate personality. 
By looking at individuals, how they suffer, their struggles, their sins, or the, how they succeed, we are looking through a small one-person window into a grander story. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the story of a people and their God. It is a story about you and I. A story that is played out in each of our lives all over the world in a thousand different ways. A story that is less about our faithfulness and more about God's faithfulness to you. The culture of Babylon was just as seductive as our own. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being shaped in thousands of different ways by the spirit and ethos of Babylon. Babylon was unmistakably pagan. They did not know the God of Israel. This is less the case in our time, but the events last week in the United States force us to acknowledge that it is hard to find the boundary between authentic worship of God, who is really God, and something else that masquerades under the same name. We are told that Nebuchadnezzar erects an image on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The king has had a dream about human empires, human power, and human pride. A warning sent to him by God, but the king has learned nothing and does not listen. Instead, he flexes his muscles and dictates the worship of everyone in his kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar is defined by his love of himself and forces others into that same love, a love that is a parody of the love of God for us. The statue is a grotesque and absurd thing. It's 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, meant to bring about an enforced sense of unity and solidarity around the absolute loyalty to the king. All of the leaders representing all the nations and languages of the world are summoned before the statue and are commanded to fall down in worship before it. It truly is, though, only a parody of worship. Why is idolatry so deadly? Author N.T. Wright says this, when human beings give their heartfelt allegiance to and worship that which is not God, they progressively cease to reflect the image of God in them. One of the primary laws of human life is that you become like what you worship. What's more, you reflect what you worship, not only to the object itself, but also outward to the world around those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of it and treat others as creditors, debtors, partners, or customers rather than human beings. Those who worship power define themselves in terms of it and treat other people as either collaborators, competitors, or pawns. These and many other forms of idolatry combine in a thousand ways, all of them damaging to the image-bearing quality of the people concerned and of those whose lives they touch. But this idol also comes with a potent threat attached to it. If the people do not bow down and worship it, they are going to be killed. In a literal sense, the idol and Nebuchadnezzar are laying claim to being the center of these people's lives and well-being. Nebuchadnezzar is making himself this center, that the people will be dependent on him. It's our basic human sin. We usurp God's rightful place as our center, as his center, and the source of our life. We want another Lord other than God. So under this duress, 
Everyone buys into the lie. They all bow down like Pavlov's dogs at the sound of the music, lured in by the spectacle of it all. The smart leaders of Babylon have become a mindless mass of unthinking people. All of them except three young Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For them, the only worthy recipient of Israel's worship was the God who had brought them out of the iron-smelting furnace of Egypt so that they could be his inheritance. The God who had created his people out of nothing and the God who spoke this whole world into being, the God of truth. The command to worship the statue was a command that no God-fearing Jew could ever obey. How could three young men who had risen through the ranks find the strength to renounce everything that they had achieved? They had everything to live for. Babylon was theirs. So what was their secret? They trusted that God alone was the source and center of all things, that only in this God was true freedom and purpose found. So imagine the scene. We are told three times in the story that the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces bowed down before the statue. It impresses upon us the breadth and depth and power that is arrayed against the three young Hebrew men. They are isolated and unique amongst hundreds of important people who are all too ready to bow down to whatever idol offers them personal or ideological advantage. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stick out like sore thumbs. We are told four times about the horns, the pipes, the lyres, the harps, the bagpipes, and every kind of music. This repetition in the music creates a hypnotic and numbing totalitarian effect on the crowd. It's used to elicit a mindless response. It's all meant to induce a sort of groupthink and a loss of discernment. All to help sell the lie of Nebuchadnezzar's idol. All of this is brought to bear against these three young Hebrew men. Imagine the pressure they are under to conform, and yet they resist. But they are also caught, and a remarkable exchange occurs. Nebuchadnezzar asks, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? If you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? If there was any doubt about Nebuchadnezzar's pride before, he has made things very clear here. The king has elevated himself above any god, including his own, and he has assumed unchecked power. The king's question is a sarcastic challenge to the three young men, a challenge for their god to come and defeat him. What Nebuchadnezzar does not count on is the God of God's responding to his challenge on behalf of his beleaguered people. This is the same question that we ask in these beleaguered times, though. Who is the God that will deliver us? Deliver us from this time we find ourselves in, from this division, from violence, and from uncertainty. Who is the God who shall deliver us from our burdens and our guilt? Who is the God that shall deliver us from our tyrants of sin and death? We spend our lives searching in vain for salvation, finding all kinds of false substitutes. But we need not search for this God. For God is the one who is ever coming to us to deliver us from the fires 
of life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answer the king. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, then let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue. This is one of the most extraordinary utterances in all the Bible. Our God is able to deliver us, the men say, and our God will deliver us. Deliver us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down. Imagine trying to fundraise for a church budget with a statement like that. This is a statement, though, of ultimate trust in God for his own sake, based on the truth of who God is alone. God is God whether he chooses to intervene on the human stage or not. His majesty, his righteousness, his worthiness to be worshipped does not depend on any set of conditions that we might devise. The three young men believed that it was infinitely better to die praising the living God in truth than it was to compromise his honor by acting as though he were no better than Nebuchadnezzar's cheap image, a God bound to and limited by the needs and demands of his followers, a God who would be at the beck and call of those who claim to worship him. And so the king is enraged. He orders the furnace to be heated to a temperature that matches his fury and has his storm troopers throw the three young men into it bound hand and foot. But what the king sees astonishes him. He says, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Four men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are not alone in the fire. A revelation, a truth is revealed, exposing the lie of Nebuchadnezzar's idol, robbing it of all of its power. God is on the side of the meek and the lowly, inspiring hope for this small community of exiles in their desperate time of need. God is faithful, and through an intercessor, God is with the young men, bearing witness to the truth of all things. The theologian Robert Jensen writes this, the word of God that determines history is itself fully involved amid the clashing and joining bodies that make history. God does not rule only from without the rough and tumble of history, but also from within it. Brothers and sisters, you are not alone. Whatever your trial may be, Christ is with you on your side, your intercessor, your advocate. He is with you now in these words and in your prayers. He is with you through the people of this church. He is, his very spirit and presence are with you now. A God who is not passive, but active. A God who isn't a bystander, but intervenes. A God who is not silent but speaks. A God who is with you in the flames of pandemics and cancers, conflict and strife, because you are his. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego step out of the furnace with not a hair on their head singed. And all the people assembled, the dignitaries, the governors, the magistrates, they all see it happen. All witness the power of the God of the three young men. And Nebuchadnezzar the king is humbled. 
and confesses his awe and made a decree that still proclaims good news to you and I today. He says this, No one was to speak anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for there is no other God who is able to save in this way. Let me say that again. There is no other God able to save in this way. In the early 2000s, during the Liberian Civil War in Africa, there was a group of church ladies who met in a field alongside the main road of the capital, rain or shine, to pray and dance and to sing to God for peace, asking for God to deliver their country from its war and distress. The headline from the New York Times read, In the mud, Liberia's gentlest rebels pray for peace. That is a description of what Christians should be doing in this time, perhaps. But the pray for peace part in the article didn't quite get it right. These women weren't praying for an abstraction like peace. They were praying to a living, intervening God to come down and deliver their people like in our story. Here is how they explained it to the reporter in the Times. We are tired. We are suffering. So we come in the sun. We come in the rain to pray to our God. And leading them in a song was a woman, and she would call, Liberian mothers, thank you. And the rest called back, thank you, God, thank you. And she called, thank you for your intervention. And then they would call back, thank you, God, thank you. And then they sang, we shall overcome. To the world, it seemed crazy, a waste of time. When the article was written, many of their countrymen dismissed these people as eccentric, deluded weirdos. But listen to what one of the women said. We know God will not come down, but he will pass through people to help us. And that's what happened. Peace came in 2005. The praying women of the world surely thank the United Nations, the peacekeepers, the work of world leaders who brought them peace, but they praised and glorified God. Because God passed through to deliver them from the fires of war and bring forth justice and peace. These women weren't deluded. They knew the truth in a world of lies. There is no other God who is able to save. Brothers and sisters, the events in the U.S. Capitol just over a week ago shocked many and rightfully brought outrage and condemnation. It happened on the day that Christians celebrate the light of Christ shining and revealing truth in the darkness, Epiphany. What that day revealed is that there is a spirit at work in the world that feeds off of people's anger and fear, captivating them with a host of lies. But let us not give in to self-righteousness. Rather, let this event compel us to ask the crucial question, to what God have we entrusted ourselves to? In fear and in powerlessness and in weakness, in frustration and in anger, we are all tempted to turn to all sorts of idols that offer power, purpose, and meaning. They all offer to save and deliver us, but they can't. All of us, not just those rioters at the Capitol, can be seduced into believing that the lie that salvation can be found elsewhere. So who have you entrusted yourselves to this day? Who is the God that will save you from anger and division, from fear? Who is the God that will inspire your hope? Only the God who comes to you, his beleaguered people, bringing grace, mercy, and peace can save. The God of the cross, Christ. Only this God can save.
And so a final story to close. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. On January 27, 1956, though, a 27-year-old king almost gave up. The Montgomery bus boycott for civil rights had been going on for months to no avail. King was receiving as many 40 phone calls a day threatening his life, his wife, and his, his children's lives. He had been arrested just days before by the police and thought that he was going to be lynched. There were a host of powers arrayed against King, just like in our story today. The lie of white nationalism and racism gripped the people of Montgomery tightly and would not let go easily. Fear and despair descended on the young king like a fog, and it reached its apex that Friday night, 1956. King was awake, sleepless, when the phone rang once more, and a sneering voice over the other end said, Leave now if you, wish, if you do not wish to die. King's fear surged, and he hung up the phone and walked to his kitchen, and with trembling hands put on a pot of coffee and sank into the chair at his kitchen table. He writes, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and I prayed aloud. And the words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, Lord. But now I am afraid. The people look to me for leadership, and I stand before them without strength and courage. They too will falter. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. And at that moment, King writes... I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear a quiet, assuring voice saying, stand up, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side for forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared and I was ready to face anything, he writes. Three days later, King's house and family would survive a bombing. But from that point on, he would be undeterred. An epiphany, a revelation of who God is had come to him. The God who is able to save. The God who is with you in fires and trials. A God who is with you to the end of the age. So, brothers and sisters, whatever trial or temptation in this world you may be facing, however weary or faithless you may feel, entrust yourselves to the God who speaks these words to you. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for that uplifting gospel of fear and also of, of redemption. At this time, uh, we are going to hear a favorite, a long-standing favorite here at LUMC, Be Strong in the Lord. And be of good courage. I'd invite everybody to stand as we finish with this.
he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. thank that song group for that beautiful, uplifting song. At this time, Randy Lapp is going to give us some information and also an invitation to the uh, 11 o'clock gathering in the foyer. Randy. Oh, good morning again. Today's service was really quite good. I find the sermon has me really thinking about some things, and I think it's good fuel for the whole week. Hey, uh, someone last week said I was on my phone in church. Well, that's how I read my bulletin now. There's no paper here. So you can blame me for being on my phone, but I'm doing good things, I am. So let's talk about Zoom again. When I was a kid, Zoom was how my dad passed slow trucks. Now it's a internet process for meeting and getting into groups and having good chats. Every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we want to get together on Zoom and do some good socializing or good discussion of sermons and different things. So let's get back on the Zoom and let's get our own coffee, our own tea or our own juice and let's really do some socializing even though there's a global pandemic. God bless you all. Thank you, Randy, for that invitation. And now join me in a sending prayer that will be followed by the sending song of peace. And now, may God bless us and keep us. May the very face of God shine on us and be gracious to us. May God's presence embrace us and give us peace in the days and weeks ahead. Amen. Peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you all rejoicing at the wonders he has shown.
Bye.